talking about Shakespeare, please give an enormous welcome to the stage to Nick Heitner and Simon Russell Beale. Thanks, Tom. This is nice. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm yes. Nick Heitner. This is Simon Russell Beale. Uh, we've been talking about Shakespeare kind of um, constantly since we first met in Stratford in 1980. 30 years ago. Yeah, 30 years yeah. ago. And we weren't working on the same show. Uh, I think you were playing Thersites and Chorus and yes. Cressida. I think and I you, was and doing you were directing King Lear, weren't you? Yes. So that's when we started talking. But we didn't actually work together for a, about Quite a long 20 time. years. Yeah. We didn't work together till... I assumed he hated my work. <laughs> but that's a typical actor's reaction. Um, he might, actually. <laughs> no, unlikely. But we, did, we have worked together many times uh, in, the, in the last 15 years at the National, only twice together on Shakespeare, on uh, Much Ado About Nothing and Time of Athens. But... Uh, we, we talk a lot about we it. We talk a lot about it, and we thought we'd just share some of the stuff we talked yeah. about. And I'll kick off by saying, how do you prepare for a part? Um, it's actually a rather plodding um, process with Shakespeare. This is not the case with other plays. I very rarely do any research outside the play. Um, the only time I ever did that was on King Lear, which was I did four years ago where I suddenly thought, oh, I need to look into Alzheimer's because I had a suspicion that Shakespeare knew somebody. It was such accurate writing that he must have known or spotted somebody uh, who had, uh, was suffering from some sort of dementia. So I did a bit of research outside the, the play, but I almost never, ever, ever, especially with the histories, of course, look at uh, real history because it's an absolute uh, blind alley. So what I do is, um, I'm afraid I mark up the whole script in terms of stress. Uh, and it, it's really, really dull work. But I try and do every single line and stress it as neutrally as possible. And I'll, I'll, go, I'll go into rather boring details if you want. Um, uh, but I sort of literally, I make every line try and fit a sort of a iambic pentameter pattern so that I know that I'm secure in my muscles. Uh, I can't quite explain it. You, you learn it as neutrally as possible with as little inflection and you just bang the rhythm in. And sometimes it's sort of counterintuitive and you produce rhythms that, you know, that don't quite make sense but make sense in terms of the verse. But you have to do it because otherwise the, sl the verse, I don't know about whether you agree, but the verse slips through your fingers. And if you don't observe that, at least part partly, the verse structure, you'll get yourself into trouble. So I, I tend to do that right way through, which is a very, very, as I say, plodding and boring uh, process. And then it's a question of, with Nick or with whoever, of building it up tiny bit by tiny bit. Um, I think that I learned very early on, and I think I'm st I still subscribe to this, that you, you don't go into a, especially a famous part with pre... Try to get rid of your preconceptions. That was my big thing. So if you're going to play the Dane as the melancholy Dane, you're, you're starting on the wrong foot if you're doing Hamlet. Or if you say, um, well, Iago is evil. If, if you start with that, then you're going to get yourself into trouble. You have to find how he's evil and whether he is evil in the first place. You might end up finding that he's not. And the discoveries you make through this tiny little building up of mosaic um, can often lead you into areas which you don't expect. A tiny example, Cassius in Julius Caesar, which in fact Nick's just directed, but not with me. Um, but when I play Cassius, I suddenly realise, I don't know whether Nick agrees with this, that he threatens to commit suicide in every single scene. It's <laughs> true. Um, which is right, until he does commit suicide. Um, and I thought, God, that's interesting, because I, I'd assumed that Cassius was, was a sort of hysteric, a sort of political hysteric. Um, and I suddenly thought, what if that threat of suicide is genuine every single time? And if you play it like that, the whole thing change, shifts around. It's not a theatrical, 
uh, gesture, it's not a cry for help, it's genuine. If Caesar becomes king, my life is not worth living and I will kill myself. And once you do that, the whole character changes and it becomes much, in that case, becomes much more um, serious. The other thing about Cassius was that he's always, I've, this, is, this, is, this is not always seen as, I've always seen him or heard about him as a polit political ma manipulator. Uh, and actually he's not very good at a political manipulation, I, I don't think. I'm, he's better than Brutus. He's, he's better than Brutus. Well, they're both hopeless. Yeah, they are hopeless. And, <laughs> you know, the actual scene of Caesar's murder is, is deliberately chaos, as I remember. Chaos, yeah. So you think, oh, that's interesting. That's not the Cassius, the, you know, the sort of moustache-twirling uh, political you know, uh, genius that I'd thought of. So it's, in other words, it's getting rid of preconceptions, I think, and then building up the tiny details of the te technical side of the part. That's how I do it. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the first thing to pick up on is that um, whatever you do, if you're the director, um, the bulk of the work comes when people start to agree to be in the play, and the part simply doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, Cassius only exists when Cassius is played. So recently, at the Bridge Theatre, uh, Cassius was played by Michelle Fairley. And Change. that is a completely, di thing, yeah. completely different character to the, to, uh, to the character you were. So wh however much you prepare, you know that the alchemy is going to happen when these lines are said by flesh and blood actors. Um, on the subject of stress, I th I, I'm not surprised that's what you do. I don't think every actor does that. And I think some actors could be waylaid and blindsided by being too religiously attached to the regular rhythm of the iambic pentameter. Um, I tend to find that uh, doing the work that you've described yields the sense of the line. And I'm always keener for the sense of the line to be paramount. Uh, d knowing how, um, and neither of us I know are what... Um, or what Peter Hall was once des described as, which was an iambic fundamentalist, where observing the caesure in the middle of every line, observing the, observing the slight pause at the end of every line. But what you can do if you do that, and, and, and actually, weirdly, I'm going to quote a sonnet. Um, if, you, if you just, when you first read through it, literally do de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum you find that maybe some famous line means something very different yes. from what you thought it meant. Yeah. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Now, the point about um, the, the famous sonnet, uh, the point about the rhythm of the line is that it's always in tension with the sense of the line and good actors like you, good actors intuitively know how to make the two work against each other. But if you actually go, let me not to the marriage of true minds <laughs> admit impediments, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It's quite an aggressive sonnet, yeah, actually. Yeah. It's <laughs> not necessarily the sonnet that will be read at my niece's wedding next Saturday. So, it's, uh, um, so I th th this is all I, really interesting stuff. I think stuff. The, the, the fundamentalist thing, because I'm not, a, as Nick says, I'm not a fundamentalist, and, uh, and I get rather uh, exercised when people insist on it being strict. And, of course... Um, let me not imagine two minds has an option. Most lines have an option or two, yeah. don't they? Yeah, they do. So you could reverse the stress on let me or let me. And it's entirely dependent on you and entirely dependent on how you want to do the sonnet. Um, I also think that I had a long... I remember years ago having a long debate with Trevor. I think Nick's absolutely right. The most important thing, the, the fundamental part of our job and certainly of my job, is that, I mean, nobody's going to see my performances twice, I assume. Um, so the thing is to try and make it as clear as possible at first hearing. Yeah. And if that means when you're doing the very, very knotty stuff that Shakespeare wrote in the middle of his life, like Measure for Measure, or indeed the stuff late in his life um, in the last plays, then if you're breaking the verse, who cares, as long as you're making sense? I, I, mean, I agree with that. But the reason you, I do it, and why I would urge actors to try and do it, even if they're inconsistent, is because it gives you a security. That's all. It's sometimes, it's sometimes words, and you heard me stumble just now, you know, I have a tendency to talk you know, and verbal. So it'll stop you doing that. It'll just, it'll just give you the weight you need in the bottom of your stomach to 
you know, do a big part. And it's, I think that's, that's sort of why. And I they think. all think quick, quickly. That's one of the things that actors inexperienced in Shakespeare have to be persuaded of, that they're playing people who have finer minds than we have, who think quicker than we do. They're all fantastic. Everyone's articulate. Everybody's articulate. They think right through to the end of the paragraph. But you just ask me... Uh, you start with that, you say, doing no research. I think it's my job to do the research, but I also, I'm going to admit, start with a hunch. And so Julius Caesar, as an example, uh, I have the same hunch that a hell of a lot of theatre directors were having over the last uh, two years, which is that a play about um, incipient dictatorship, about uh, the establishment sphere of authoritarianism, would yield something, done now. Um, you start with that if you're a director, and then you start to burrow into the play, and you come to rehearsals with quite a lot of decisions already taken, um, which if you're working with someone like Simon, um, you have already talked through with your leading actor. So Julius Caesar at the Bridge Theatre um, started with a series of hunches, which was that I thought it probably wasn't a play about um, uh, the heroic Republican resistance to a dictatorship, but about the ineptitude of the liberal elite. Actually, I think it did turn out to be that play. Uh, the, um, the liberal elite in Julius Caesar, the uh, old Republican guard, um, uh, they know that action must be taken. They take it badly and messily. Uh, they're indecisive. They are at war with each other. And they end up with something much, much worse than if they hadn't assassinated uh, Caesar in the first place. So it seemed to me to serve as an illustration, um, maybe even a warning, although I don't think it's the theatre's job to warn. Um, I also had a hunch about, which is a, a, a director's hunch, one of those knotty things that as a director you want to solve. Julius Caesar uh, is about the mob, about the manipulation of the mob. Certainly the most famous scene is about that. Um, do play having I've always been disappointed when the mob is eight actors pretending to be 800 um, uh, and I've also never been quite convinced by the mob when the decision is taken to play the mob as if they're out front um, sitting in in rows of, um, of theater seats uh, and in my new theater I had the opportunity to cast the audience as the mob and that turned me on I thought wouldn't that be wouldn't that be an exciting thing an ex purely theatrically an exciting thing to explore but so with those things in hand we then set out to explore the play week by really week in rehearsal it because having said rather blithely and in this luxurious position to have that I don't do any work at all of course you have to I mean things like you're famous for the, your modern dress production. So when we did Timon, um, I remember Nick phoning up and said, it's not Athens, of course, <laughs> it's London. I remember that conversation and saying, well, if we're setting it in, if he's writing about London, which he's sort of what, as Shakespeare always was, uh, then we set it in London and we set it in modern London. So you have to make that decision very, very early. Whereas much ado, unusually for you, you decided to do... I saw no in, benefit in from period, them. I yeah. saw, saw no benefit from um, yeah. uh, from taking but, that but as a period. But big, big decisions to yeah. make. Uh, I suppose with only your leading actors in your head by that stage. So yes, they're quite big decisions to make. And they're not take, they're not taken frivolously. Um, Timon, um, he, he he really didn't care about Athens. He really didn't care about um, a historical classical Greece. He was writing about. Uh, when when he and we'll, we should talk about time because it, 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 it's it's an obscure play, but it, it, it discussing it brings up so many of the things that we're both interested in. But when he put that play together with Middleton, it was co-authored with Middles Middleton, and it was never finished. Um, he was responding to the new game in town after the accession of James I, which was a kind of new breed of Scottish bankers. He was he was um, he was responding to. Um, an age of bling following the death of the old queen. And he was responding to uh, what happens when the bling turns to death, dust and you're left with a credit crunch. And it's a play that is rediscovered by directors and actors 
every time there's a financial crisis. Yeah. Um, when, when did we do it? 2000. We did it in 2012 in the aftermath of the 2008 crash, and we also did it because, and this was, we did it because we were asked what our contribution to the Shakespeare Olympiad was going to be that coincided with the 2012 Olympics, and I thought it would be, um, it would be a good thing if. Uh, to, down east, there was this magnificent festival of sport going on, and we were being rather sour about <laughs> big money. So, it's, uh, but but time and let's talk about time and time, let's we'll talk, talk about, about let's talk about um, scripts because that's yeah. the other thing you have to do. Um, this is my miss my. I'm fascinated by this, so please forgive me. Um, and I've just been asked to co-edit. Well, I've, they've come out actually the first ones co-edit a new edition of Shakespeare for Arden um, for performance, and so it's been a great voyage of discovery, working with academics on editing a Shakespeare strip, script. Um, just as a show of hands, how many of you know about the, the history of Shakespeare texts? A bit. Um, well, for those of you who don't, the, 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 real, the real thing to remember is there's no such thing as a set text. So the text that we were presented with at school, if you were studied King Lear, you would have been presented with a text that had been would show evidence of a heavy editorial hand. Any, any Shakespeare text uh, will probably have a lot of decisions made for you. Um, and Lear is a very good example. There are two endings of Lear uh, in existence. And there, Shakespeare, in his lifetime, produced, and then his, after his death, immediately after his death, his friends produced a series of texts uh, which don't correlate with each other. So it means that every single time you do a Shakespeare play as a performer, we have to make editorial decisions. That's true, isn't it? Even with fairly you know, secure texts. So there's the, ha half of the plays, half the plays are, uh, pretty secure. are secure because there's only one edition, the folio edition that was published by his friend seven years after his death. But half of them. The other half, they have um, three they, or four different editions. Yeah, they appeared in what was called quarter editions during Shakespeare's lifetime and then were reprinted in the big folio edition after his death. But those quarter editions are interesting. A fascinating thing that very rare quartos are the most popular plays. There's only one quarter edition left in existence of Henry IV Part I. This is counterintuitive because it was so popular, because of false stuff. And uh, so it was read to death. It, they, these copies were read till they collapsed. So there's only one, it's in the Folger Library, I think, in Washington. There's only one left, whereas popular ones, Ten a penny, you know, <laughs> because no, nobody actually opened them. But it means that you have pretty big decisions to make. And there are, I mean, in, in the very famous plays, Hamlet and Lear, for instance, you have big decisions about very famous lines. I mean, half of the most famous lines in Hamlet don't appear in the first couple of editions of that play that appeared in Ham, um, Shakespeare's lifetime. So you have to make decisions as an actor and as a director to go, well, I think people will miss Denmark as a prison, for instance, which only appears in the third edition of Hamlet. Or they might miss, there's a whole soliloquy that doesn't appear in the third edition but does appear in the second. I mean, it it's, it's, it's sounds tedious, but I find it fascinating because it means that you have to work, there's no way of working out what Shakespeare wanted, unfortunately, um, and whether these editions were a response to um, Shakespeare saying, I'm going to cut that soliloquy in Hamlet because, frankly, it doesn't work, which is what you do in the modern theatre. If something doesn't work, you just cut it. Um, or whether it was some sort of other decision by other people or by an actor or by editors. You, we, we will never know. But uh, Can I, I interrupt one second? Because I think this is... The, I, can, I have current experience of this, uh, rehearsing the new Alan Bennett play, which opens in a couple of weeks. Uh, Alan, these days, delivers a lot of material, and essentially says, you organise it. And a couple of weeks ago, I said to him, he comes into rehearsal um, for a short period every day, I said, J just look at this scene, because I have reordered it, cut it quite a lot, and put something in from Act 2, see what you think. And he watched it through, and I said, OK? He said, I couldn't tell the difference. Um, <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many playwrights are like that, and there is no reason to think that Shakespeare... Shakespeare, really Shakespeare they, they, were, they were a collective. They yeah. were... Um, yeah. uh, well, they weren't. There were, there were six shareholders who were the bosses. But, um... but Timon's a very interesting case. Well, let's talk a bit about Timon, because, as Nick says, it was unfinished. It probably wasn't intended to be printed in the folio. That's its first appearance in 1623, because they were waiting on Troilus and Cressida, and they didn't have the rights to print it. 
So um, we know that because the rare toilet crust has slipped in. But they had problems with that, so they thought, oh, God, what are we going to put in its place? Because there were lots of blank pages. And they found this old thing called Time in Athens, which was obviously shoved under a drawer. And it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it has magnificent sections, but it doesn't make any sense. So Nick's job, and I suppose my job to a lesser mm-hmm. extent, but Nick's job, we had a week before we started, didn't we? Uh, just round the table going... I mean, there's one whole scene, honestly... We cut the whole thing, didn't we? Because it had uh, the one with Alcibiades. Oh, and, it makes that mean, mess. That's a terrible I scene. I mean, there was yes. literally <laughs> there was no reason for it to be there. Um, and so the rehearsal period was... That was rather an extreme case of editing a Shakespeare play because we also added bits. Added bits, rewrote bits, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that... The... Uh, and no one noticed. That's what's no. so funny. No. Except for Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes had just done uh, the film version of Coriolanus, so when he came and saw it, he said, that line about the eagles pecking the doors, that's from Coriolanus, isn't it? Yeah, it? Yeah. It, yeah. And actually, this is, what, this is one of my favourite pedant, pedantic stories about Nick. It was a, it was a line from Coriolanus, which was uh, from uh, Rome, obviously, and it was talking about the doors pecking the eagles, actually, wasn't it? I yeah. Think. Um, the common people attacking the patricians of Rome. And Nick came in one day, and I'd, I'd love to read this, he said, we can't have eagles. I said, why can't we have eagles? Because it's Athens. And the, the bird of Athens is an owl. <laughs> so we spent about an hour trying to get the light, to find an owl which scanned. <laughs> uh, because owl is obviously one syllable and eagles too. So we were barn owls, snow owl, <laughs> big owl, brown In the owl. end we didn't care, we did didn't we? Know, we didn't <laughs> care. Um, but the last line, it, uh, this is t- typical of Timon, the, the play fizzles out. And in fact, actually, Timon dies twice, which is sort of some indication of what stage the play was at. Um, and uh, we, we, cut, we cut one of the deaths, but so Timon actually didn't die, he just wandered off, didn't he? But the last line, we had no last line, do you remember? And you said, yeah. we just need a... <laughs> just a... <laughs> to take us off. Um, and as I remember it, I don't know if it's true, but you said to the stage manager, she could find a line with freedom in it. The word freedom from Shakespeare. Just find all the lines with the word freedom you in can, it. You can do this on a concordance in that. Yeah. So I re- this is my memory. The, me- the stage manager, wading through, or the assistant director, wading through on the computer, finding lines with freedom. And the last line of our version of Time in Athens came from As You Like It. <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's so true. proud of that. It's and honestly, true. no one noticed. No. No one does notice. It, 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 Timon was the, the scholarship on Timon is really clear. Half the play was written by Middleton, who and sh- by the end of his career, Shakespeare was tossing scenes into other people's plays. They 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 helped each other out the way screenwriters do. You can yeah. tell which bits are which. Can't yeah, you? you can. Even even if you're not. You can. A, an but I think I think we're both of us. We're both of us. Uh, um, as time goes on, um, most concerned with. Delivering these plays in, an, in, a, in a coherent and exciting way, just for now, just for the moment, we, we perform them. The play on the page will always exist. The notion that it is our job to deliver every word in a definitive fashion, I think we both dismiss and both find well, rather bizarre. The, the, um, uh, doing this editing job, I, and I didn't realise this, there's a whole... Um, double track of Shakespeare editing that goes through from the 17th century, middle of the 17th century, um, and it's sort of slightly died out now, but there's an academic track. There's a sort of the track that produces the text as fully and as comprehensively as the editor thinks is, is feasible. And then there's a track which I had, had no idea about, which was performance editions. So right from the middle of the 17th century, you're getting editions of plays as seen, as acted at the Drury Lane, as acted at His Majesty's Theatre, whatever, uh, like Shakespeare himself did his first editions, as acted by. So these editions were, I don't know what, who they were bought by, uh, whether they were bought as souvenirs of, um, of performances that people had seen. It's interesting that when, for instance, um, Tom Hiddleston did Coriolanus at the Don I noticed they produced an edition of the Coriolanus that Tom was in, presumably, because people would like it as a sort of souvenir or a memory of Tom fans, you know, Tom fans would buy it as a souvenir. So I don't know quite what these 17th century editions were for, 
Um, and it goes right the way through the 19th century, right the way through to French's edition. I don't know how, how many remember French's edition. I think they're still going, but they don't do Shakespeare anymore. But they ended up in the, what's that, the early 20th century and doing editions which would tell you how to do it, down to costume details, down to blocking. And I presume that was when weekly rep was in existence and people had to just turn out these plays very, very quickly and were just grateful for any help they could get. Uh, Frenchs, I think, don't do Shakespeare anymore, and the idea of separate performance editions has died out. But what's interesting about the 17th century, they almost all have prefaces which say, this play... Uh, well, firstly, they're very critical about Shakespeare. They say some of it is obscene and um, inappropriate for our audiences in the mid-17th century, but all of them say they're too long. All of them. Uh, so the idea of cutting a Shakespeare play is not new and the idea of and it's always puzzled us that the famous line in Romeo and Juliet isn't it about the two hours traffic of this stage that you cannot even if you spoke at the speed of light do the whole text as is extant of Romeo and Juliet in two hours you just couldn't so presumably they have always cut and I reckon in my humble opinion that Shakespeare cut I bet he sat there at the Globe and at Blackfriars and regularly went, no, let's get rid of that, you know. Um, and I'm sure he improvised with his... Not, work's being done on this, it's just beginning to be done, but I bet he did um, a lot more collaboration with his performers. I'm sure he did, and he was quite low status. He, he ended up high status. He was low status when he started yeah. writing. And I, they, they, there would have been actors who would have been higher status than him who would have said, yes. I'm not doing this, yes, I can't... Burbage, yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's talk, let's move on and let's talk about what happens in rehearsal. And we, if we talk about plays we've both done but separately, Hamlet, for instance, or Othello, Iago. Yeah. Um, Hamlet, well, ha let's do Hamlet. Let's do Hamlet. So how did, how did you put your Hamlet together? Actually, fun, that was an unusual... We're going, going back to text again. But that was unusual because we had... Um, uh, talk about cutting... The director of the Hamlet that I did, John Caird, said we, we, we can't do four hours. Um, and uh, there are always practical things that you have to think about. We were touring it around the world and no theatre was happy about taking four hours. It's quite funny at the moment in London, I think it's, it's lovely, two hour shows are great, eight hour shows are great, but three, four is really tricky. Um, and, it, and it's always been difficult to sell because how do people fit it into their days? Um, anyway, so we knew we had to get an hour out, uh, and he made the decision uh, that he would cut a whole character, a whole, so did a sort of clean uh, excision, which is a Fortinbras, which again, funnily enough, goes right back to the 17th century. Fortinbras has regularly been cut um, as a whole chunk, so that he could, he could concentrate in detail on the bit that he, wanted, he was interested in and not worry about uh, the political dimension of the play. Having done that, we then sat round for two hours without a, 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 an actor cast as Fortin Brass, and we spent a long time, longer than I've ever done before, of cutting it. We cut it as a company, which I've never done before, and it, it was laborious, and it was tedious, and it took two weeks. Um, but that's very unusual. Uh, but it did mean that everyone was happy with <laughs> their parts by the end of it, so nobody was complaining about that. Um, then, I mean, I, I always... I don't know whether you like that bit, but I love that bit when you sit round the table, as I, which quite a lot of directors do, just to talk through the play, because that, that's when all bets are off. When, and you will often discuss things that you will never discuss again because there just isn't time. Um, and uh, I've always loved that sort of excavation of the text uh, in detail. And then, I mean, most... From then, it's a... Depends on the director, actually. You're quite quick at blocking it, aren't you? Well, I, I find... I love that bit, too. And you and I think in quite similar ways. Um, we, you know, we both studied English at the same university. So. I'm very aware that some of the best actors I've ever worked with are not, a, are not intellectuals. And, the, and I 
don't want ever to run a rehearsal room where you feel inadequate because you can't go blah 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 like we like we can and i think we're we're pretty lethal together and i you i'm i'm going to say this to you now i've always got one eye on the rest of the room when you and i get going <laughs> whether when we're um, yeah, right. because i'm thinking they're all sitting around thinking oh, when God, are they going to shut yeah. up <laughs> So that's my, it's my job. It's my job to make sure that people whose approach to, uh, to building a character and to speaking the lines is from the gut, is instinctual, um, are making as big a contribution as those who can forensically also take it apart. Different rates. I've always found this fascinating about directing, that people don't develop on a rehearsal room floor at the same rate. You know, you can get some that's actors right. who are w way ahead in their thoughts and in, their, in the... In the skill with which they're presenting it yeah. than others. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, hopefully everyone arrives at the same place at the same time. But, yeah. but being able to judge, no, that person is just taking time there. That, that's a, a different process is going on there from that person there. You know, I think but let, let's see the substance, just a little bit, a tiny bit of the substance of Hamlet. Because I think if you're a director, you don't go ahead unless... You can't go ahead with Hamlet unless you're building it around an actor. And I was building it around uh, Rory Kinnear, another, another intellectual, but actually much less voluble than you. A lot of what, a lot of what, <laughs> a lot of what Rory's doing, uh, he doesn't share. You will share everything. But Rory and I had talked a lot about the play. I started with both the world and an idea about where Hamlet's depression is rooted and even by talking about Hamlet's depression I am demonstrating that my thinking about Hamlet is very much on the current money um, the fact that Hamlet uh, might be depressed um, in the way we understand depressed is relatively new although by the way I think nothing would be more boring than to approach playing the part of Hamlet from the point of view of a medical diagnosis that kind of closes you down yeah. in rehearsal but I uh, I started with. You can't even do that with Lear. To go back to the outside. You can't. Easy. That's you have to. You, you have to go Human moment by moment. Yeah. Start. Um, so I, I'm. I started with an idea about um, about Hamlet rooted in its own time. So much current, great current scholarship about uh, about Shakespeare. Really popular scholarship. Jane Shapiro, Stephen Greenblatt, Jonathan Bate roots it so firmly in the world that it he, that he wrote it for. You know how you realize Hamlet is about a surveillance state, about a totalitarian monarchy that kept tabs on everybody by making sure that everybody was listening to what everybody else said. It felt very, very familiar. That was the London of Elizabeth I that feels like... Um, it, it, I, don't, I don't think we can pretend we lived through that at all. Not at all. But if you're staging Hamlet, you need to find a kind of good, theatrically vibrant correlative for a surveillance state um, where you really can't trust even members of your own family not to report you to the authorities. So that was one of the first things we did. But I, I remember... D d d not totally related to that. Another decision that we took, which I'm kind of lobbying to you because I think you might disagree with this, is that um, I thought one of the roots of Hamlet's problems was that he didn't have a good relationship with his father. That actually, that uh, when the ghost of Hamlet's father appears, the ghost says not one kind or affectionate word to him. And what you know about Hamlet is that he's been absent from court for a very long time at university in Wittenberg, that he couldn't be more different from what you are told about what his father was like, a, a person who's, who was busy out there smiting the... Um, went around the, 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 wearing the, armour. Went around wearing armour and he smote the something Polak, Polak. The sledded Polak. Polak on the ice. So his father was no brute. Um, and Hamlet is obviously not. And... The struggle to m make himself uh, measure up to what his father, his father's ghost is expecting of him felt to me to be a very profound and depressing weight on his shoulders. But I think you well, might have gone no, differently on that. It's not, it's not a question of disagreement. Because actually what's interesting about Shakespeare, as we know, is that you can make these decisions yeah. and they're equally valid. I decided that Hamlet loved his father. Um, yeah. Uh, but it is interesting you say, uh, and they had a good relationship, whatever that means. Um, and we have this, this entire invention, there's nothing to support it in the text at all, but I decided that's where I'd start from. 
And it's interesting about the speech from, the, from Purgatory uh, that the father delivers, because, of course, it's a suicide mission. I mean, I, I think Hammond is listening to it thinking, what, 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 yeah. do you, what do you, are you expect me to go and... What do you expect me to do? Go and kill the king and my what, mother's husband? I mean, how? I mean, I, 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 my hand was sitting there going, well, that, that's a death sentence. If I pursue this, it's a death sentence. Um, and also, I love things like um, when he comes back, the ghost into... Well, no, it's actually it's earlier, I think. He says, can you please warn your mother <laughs> that she's behaving badly? Um, but, uh, but do it gently and, and don't, don't um, you know, disturb her too much. You're thinking, well, I mean... Uh, I mean, how? <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, Hamlet's version is, um, he says to his mother, look, stop having sex with Claudius tonight. <laughs> don't, don't tonight. And then it'll be easier tomorrow night. And then it'll be easier the night after. thinking, this guy has never had sex, I don't think. <laughs> I think he has absolutely no understanding. So I'm sort of half in agreement. Things you can go either route, really. The, the, um, all I knew about Hamlet... I can have questions in a minute. Because... Um, I just started at th- that period of my career, learning whole, the whole thing before I started, because I was becoming aware that it gets a little bit harder. Um, uh, so I'd learnt it, and uh, so I didn't have any specific grand ideas. I just knew what I was frightened of, one of which was madness. What I, the hell would I do about madness? And the second thing, and I did, I did actually feel fairly strongly about this, was I didn't want to play the scene with Gertrude which is validly played um, often as a sort of sublimated, sexually violent scene. It's absolutely valid. Um, and uh, as I remember, I think it was Olivier who he might not have started that. Well, I think it was Freud it. who started it, it. And it's and more. Ernest, it's, well, and Ernest Jones. Jones and it's yeah. more about. It, I mean, it, it, it's more about them than it is about the scene. And, yeah. and, but but it's, I, had, I had a sort of. I had a thing about that scene that it should be a. I suppose I'm too middle class. I mean, I just thought that's not how I would talk to my mother. So I, I, I wouldn't throw her on the bed and jump on top of her. It just wouldn't. It just would never occur to either. <laughs> that was a, that was a, a, a proper way to behave. So I, I just took what I knew about my life and my relationships, and as the all, as all actors do, and sort of made it into a, a different type of scene. It's interesting though that the, as it was reviewed around the world. I remember there was one review somewhere that mentioned the scene where um, Hamlet sexually attacks his mother. And it was obviously that was the way the, the reviewer thought the scene was written. So I had some two ideas. The madness was an interesting one because I avoided it completely. I <laughs> and, it, and I admit now, 18 years later, that it was cowardice. I thought, yeah, I could go on wearing a, you know, a panda outfit or whatever and... and but I thought, I can't carry that off. I, I, I can't do madness. And then I thought, actually, uh, I don't think he's mad at all. Um, and I think uh, uh, it's interesting who's the first person who defines him as being mad, and it's Polonius, mm. uh, who's not the most accurate reader of human nature in the play. And, and he says very casually, no, he's mad because he's in love with my daughter. And you think, you, you, you're completely wrong. And I just had this whole idea that he was... You know, I am but mad north northwest. You know, I'm I'm as mad as a person who is in this dreadful situation of grief, in my case, and of um, uh, of being given a, as I say, a suicide mission to kill his uncle. You know, uh, that would make you mad, uh, but it's only that mad. So that, but that's that was my decision, and it's no more valid than. Than any others. No, so and I think that's that's that is that's the, it, that's the great thing about these plays is that it brings me back to what I said that um, that they don't exist except through the flesh and blood of the people who who play them. I mean, just d- d- we d- yeah, just we'll move on. But but as an example I'm of what happens, no, no, I'm, a bit, we do, I'm I was I'm absolutely with you on um, on the, the what they call the closet scene, the scene in Gertrude's bedroom. Um, I d- I never saw, I, nor did Rory. We neither of us ever saw anything in it. That was yeah. um, that was. Uh, it's interesting how these things build up. No, it, it isn't. And, 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 uh, and performance tradition weighs them down. But what we did ask at one point was Claire Higgins, who played Gertrude, and Rory and I said, "Why, you know, the ghost reappears in that scene, and 
uh, to remind Hamlet what his mission is, and Gertrude doesn't see the ghost. And we said, why doesn't she see the ghost? Everybody else sees the ghost. Why doesn't Gertrude see the ghost? Horatio, now, sees, the ghost. Horatio sees the ghost. The soldiers on the battlement sees the ghost. Um, Actually, I can give you a good reason. It's an academic reason that Elizabethan ghosts did appear. Um, to, they, they, do, they do seem to have had the ability to appear to whoever it's dramatically convenient for them to <laughs> appear to. And, but we're not. not easy to play. But we're not. We're not uh, in the study. We're on the stage. Why can't this woman see the ghost that everybody else sees? And the answer is, well, maybe she does. And maybe she lies about it. And that's how we played it. And it was very, maybe, very exciting. Maybe. It wasn't right and it wasn't wrong. It's yeah. just what we did. But it, and, it, it, it but it, and it's interesting that, that we have the things like the, it's a very good reading that, isn't it? Um, the uh, we also agree with things like um, the sentimentality at the end of Lear. Um, I, I got the the histories are crude over Lear being by the end sort of rather um, uh, sweet at the end, and he has been through a lot. But he's, a, he's an old brute, of course, at the same time. And we both had this thing about... There's a, a famous scene where Cordelia comes back, obviously, and he wakes up. And, and then the next scene they have is that Lear's going, oh, darling, we can go off and to prison together and, uh, and we'll sing like two birds in a cage. And she says nothing. And I kept on thinking, he's bonkers. He's, he's just been captured by the enemy with his daughter and he's proposing that they spend the rest of their life in prison and it'll, it's a good idea. He's and learned nothing, he's learned nothing. It. And it's a very interesting moment of Shakespearean um, technique because the speech is absolutely beautiful. It's exquisite. And the danger is that what's being said is not. And I think that's a real Shakespearean tug. And our job is to, is, to, is to invite all... Uh, all daughters, all daughters in their 20s in the audience and all fathers above 50 to think how great an invitation is that? Darling, let's go off to prison and for the rest of our lives we'll sing together like birds in the cage. It's the most horrible, <laughs> creepy invitation. <laughs> and I think one of our jobs is to kind of present the scene in that way as a challenge to the sentimentality. Anyway, we... I love, I love that oh, Cordelia doesn't respond. I mean, that's what I know. She's yeah. a, she's, oh, she say, oh, Dad, that's... Such a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Anyway, we should we should we throw should it over. Yeah. Yes. Does yeah. anybody want? We've got fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to both of you, you were talking about changing. There's no settled text. You can change it according to the mores of the time. Cordelia didn't die for about 150 <laughs> years <laughs> between the early 1600s and Samuel Johnson's version. And I just wonder where the line is between treating it as your own text to explore and where the vision of the artist remains. Well, um, I'll clarify that first. Mm. I mean, the, th the thing about, I mean, actually, we, we don't change it at will. I mean, we've, we've got the options um, in front of us, and the options are all what we call the authoritative texts, what you know as authoritative texts, which, is, which are, are the ones that were printed in Shakespeare's lifetime and the first folio. We don't tend to go into the other folios unless there's, or later edition, unless there's some particular, and there are a couple of invented lines. Falstaff has an invented line that's invented in the 18th century, uh, which everyone uses because otherwise you'd be saying gobbledygook. But most of the time you use the versions that were contemporaneous with Shakespeare. So the idea of, I mean, it's really interesting to do the, the version where Cordelia marries Edgar and, and Lear survives, but I don't think... I'm not sure it would be. I think we, I think we we draw, at the moment we draw the line at materially changing uh, the uh, what we consider. I mean, it is all subjective, isn't it? What we consider to be um, the story of the play, the uh, um, the 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 outline of the play. I cut. 25% of Julius Caesar. Again, nobody... It, I really did... I, I put that in two hours. And what criteria was I using? Mainly, well... <laughs> after the funeral, after Friends, Romans, Countrymen, Julius Caesar notoriously tails off long, long, boring Act 5 battle scenes. So I, my main criterion is what's boring. Get, and what's incomprehensible, and get rid of that. But those criteria do change, I think, generation by generation. Yes, I mean, it's an it is an interesting question, because I, I mean, I, I mean, you know, there's that famous line Garrick put into Richard III, wasn't it? So much for Buckingham. Yeah. Um, 
and there's some. I mean, there's a bit of me that thinks, well, why not put it back in? But I think, I think whatever we do, I mean, Nick's writers, the most of it's about narrative clarity and uh, and pace, actually, I suppose. But whatever we do, we can go. No, this was this was a line that Shakespeare knew about. Do you know what I mean? Um, otherwise, I think I think you do get into trouble. Yeah. Should get around there. <laughs> One of the happiest moments I've ever had in the theatre is when you jumped in the, <laughs> the pool in Much Ado, which I think was your production, Nick. Yeah. Could you describe that scene and how you pulled it together? Oh, God. Um, I remember Nick showing us the set. Um, and I remember the pool being revealed. I'll tell you how the pool happened. Very, very beautiful set that Vicky Mortimer designed. It took a long time, as it always does. And at quite a late stage, I said, put a pool there, I know I can use it. <laughs> that was from my gut. You, yeah. Then the rest is... The rest... Well, uh, yes, of course we couldn't build it in the rehearsal. <laughs> obviously. So every time I finished that scene, I would go... Psh, and, <laughs> and, and then do the rest of the scene. And of course... After about four weeks, there's no, nothing is ever funny. Um, and uh, and certainly my performance wasn't. And I just remember saying from crouching down on the floor in the pool, saying to me, is this going to be funny? And he said, it'll be funny. Um, I mean, it, it had nothing to do with me. Do you know what I mean? I mean I yes, can, but I it was. It was. Of course it was. But it I was had such glee. Too. This is the oh. scene where Benedict hides, but all his friends n know he's hiding, but Benedict doesn't know that he's been rumbled. And I think any production of Much Do About Nothing you go to, you want to know how, they, how, is, how are they going to deal with Benedict hiding, the audience, you, every, everybody knowing what everybody else is thinking. Um, you've got to, it's a, it's, again, it's a director's challenge, a designer's challenge, how do you do this hiding place? And the combination of you and a Paul and... It, and was, it was interesting because Mark, irresistible. Mark, the great Mark Addy, who was one of the... He was a fantastic dog breed, I don't really remember. He was fantastically funny. But I remember he gave me a couple of clues in the bits before that because I, have, I don't think I have a natural instinct to do physical comedy um, and there was for instance there was a pillar, not a pillar but a sort of a strut holding up part of the portico of this house and I remember he said why don't you try and hide behind this very very thin <laughs> <laughs> and Mark's a big big guy like me and, uh, and I thought yes absolutely so I was, I was reliant on people like Mark to give me a couple of ideas before the pool uh, but the pool itself, as I, I mean, I, 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 I do say it, nothing to do with me. It was warm, too. I can't tell you. Um, it was just heaven to do a whole soliloquy floating in the bath. It's what you do at, it's what you do at home. There was, there was one night, uh, there was one horrible night when it overheated. And I, and I came out, and I was the colour of your trousers. <laughs> and I was pink, pink, pink. And I did that awful thing, which I, I presume you do if you're in a very hot water, which is to move... It had to keep moving for some bizarre reason, so it was, the whole soliloquy was done. Yeah. Um, and I do remember getting up. <laughs> oh, God, I can be vulgar. I can remember getting out. Because they, they built it so that I could stay down for an unconscionably long time. It was as if um, he was a sort of aquatic man, mammal. Um, I was down there for ages, wasn't I? Because I had found a way of breathing as if I was still down there. So I oh, thought, what the hell? Because it was deep enough, you know, for, for those who didn't see it, deep enough for me to disappear completely. And then come up, and they all said the car said it was like a seal, coming up. And I used to get up, dripping, and turn round, and I used to clench my buttocks. It was so coarse. <laughs> because my, my trousers by that stage were clinging. To me. And of course, Beatrice comes on, my now beloved. And in order to make myself more attractive, I used to clench my whole body. <laughs> so the audience just sees all these buttocks go like this. Terrible. Terrible. That's an, actually, that's an interesting... Oh, sorry, there's an interesting soliloquy about editing. And there was a correspondence in The Guardian recently about it. In the middle of that speech, he does... He goes... Um, uh, love me. Oh, love... Uh, yes. Uh, love uh, me. Love me. Why it must be requited yeah. is the line why, comma, it must be requited. 
I think it's Derek Jacobi, but I'm not sure. I think it was Derek, yeah. Who invented Love Me, Why? Question mark. It must be requited. It's a cracker. And uh, I don't think there's a bit of Benedict who since then has not done that completely outrageous piece of repunctuation. But it wasn't Shakespeare who punctuated it in the first place. It's the folio editors who punctu punctuated it. <laughs> Probably used a couple of commas somewhere, didn't he? I don't know. Yeah, who, know, who, knows, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, um, you've talked about uh, successful interpretations so far. Give us an insight of what happens when it all goes terribly oh, wrong. wrong. <laughs> Do you want to start? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um... I did a Macbeth, which I wasn't happy with. Uh, I, it's, it's a very difficult thing to explain what it feels like. Um, uh, and I think part of the problem with it was that I unusually... It's a, it's a play I love, and it's a play I have very firm opinions about that I would like to see on stage. And um, uh, I think that was the problem. I think I, I, uh, I wrote one good essay when I was doing my degree, one good essay. Uh, uh, that I, and I wrote it was about my birth. And I had this thing about it, and I, and, I, and I would still, I would love to do it again. Because I still think it's a valid, my thoughts were, were valid, but, but we, it didn't work. And uh, I can't... I can't pinpoint why a particular specific reason why, but it's uh, I think the, the reason was at my door, and it's because I was forcing it into a place. Um, I didn't want any blood, for a start, which in Macbeth is tricky. Um, and I wanted to be completely stationary for the whole of the fifth act, like Jabba the Hutt, um, for various reasons. I still think it has a has a possibility, but it's it has an inbuilt <laughs> boringness about it, doesn't it? <laughs> if Beth is just sitting there like for, for half an hour. So, yeah, that wasn't a great one. Yeah, it's... You see, um, I think every Shakespeare production I've done has, has, has had some marvellous performances in it, sometimes probably, sometimes definitely marvellous in spite of me, so I don't think any of them were, were total write-offs, but the two parts of Henry the Fourth that I did at the National, I think, were the least successful I did at the National because I, I was, I loved them too much. I think I didn't really, I didn't really have anything other than a gut feeling that were, that these two plays are genuinely top-ranked Shakespeare that the National Theatre should do, and Michael Gambon should play Falstaff, and it, the, I thought the production was rather one. Um, uh, I, I, I think. The, the ones that I've done that I feel happiest about are the ones that probably in 20 years I, I will be thinking why, uh, why on earth did I do it that way because um, you know Henry V done in the immediate aftermath of the Iraq war as a play about um, why we go to war and what soldiers feel about um, leaders who cook up uh, specious reasons for going to war that felt so totally alive if you say is that what Henry V is about no it's a, it, it's a, it is as always with Shakespeare one thing and another it is um, a tub thumping patriotic play that was written as a big crowd pleaser but he can't help seeing everybody else's point of view and seeing everybody in the round too but uh, so I never think I feel happy when the plays are brought to life by great actors and seem to connect with a moment but and when they do I've, I've I've been very very fortunate with the great actors who have who I've worked with on Shakespeare and and I've and they've generally been pretty great but I've, I I don't I don't like my work in retrospect when I think it's been one yeah Is there any Shakespeare play you don't feel transposes into any era? I mean, I saw, saw the Julius Caesar, I thought it was amazing, but do you think there's any Shakespearean play that would not transpose to current day, to another time, place? 
I think they change all the time. We change all the time and they change all the time. And a, and a play that might once have seemed remote suddenly bubbles to the surface and seems contemporary. Um, I do think, you know, d d taking the Henry IV plays as an example, I do think, I thought at the time, this is a play about a specifically Tudor fear of civil strife. And I don't see that, that plunging it into the contemporary world will do anything for what animates the play. Now I think if you did a production of Henry IV which was about town versus country, north versus south, populist against London establishment, you'd be in business. It didn't seem like that back in 2004 or 5 or whenever we did it. So I think the times change and the plays change with them. And as I said, they're always there tomorrow. Somebody will always do them better tomorrow if you fail. So, uh, that, so I, think, I think the answer to your question is probably um, at the moment, yes, there may be one or two, but they may be the very ones that seem contemporary tomorrow, do you think? Yes, it seems about the, the, uh, going back to Much Ado being the one that we, you decided you decided to do in contempt because we need you needed a world it bit depends on the world the worlds are quite specific in an odd way although they can transmogrify depending on our reaction to it but for instance much to i think has to have a world wherever it's where it have to be where, where men and women live pretty segregated lives <coughs> um so it's difficult to explain if you put it in certain situations why the women don't ever talk to the men um but but that doesn't mean it can't be contemporary, you know, because there are plenty of situations in the contemporary world where women are separated from men. But I think, so there are sort of certain demands that the plays make that if you can find a response in the modern world, but I, I think the answer is that none of them won't respond to transposition of all, ty all types, actually. I think we've done, haven't we? One more? Okay, one more. Nope. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Nick, in your uh, in your Julius we Caesar, we saw a woman playing Cassius. Yeah. A question for Simon: Is there a Shakespearean woman that you would a like oh, to play yes. and b think you could play? Oh, that's a different question. Um, <laughs> well, uh, did, can joking, I just? But oh, sorry. She was played. This was not Michelle Fairley playing Cassius as a man. Please don't notice I'm a woman. Cassius was, was a, a woman. woman yes. So of course, there are different, yes, there are different questions that come up, don't they? Yeah. But if you're asking me, is there a part which I would like to play as a woman? Yes, Cleopatra. Well, I, I couldn't. <laughs> but it, uh, I saw Mark Rylance do it, and it was amazing. And, uh, and I have actually, for the Open University, recorded some of her speeches. I don't know when they're still in existence. Um, no, if, if in an, a, a parallel universe, I should be playing Cleopatra. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's one of the greatest roles ever written for a woman. But, uh, and, the, and there are things like, odd enough, things like the Countess in uh, All's Well Tensor, again, as a woman. In terms of women's parts as a man, I don't think that's possible, is it, really? I don't think I can think of one. Um, you know, like Michelle did for Cassius, I don't think I could transform... Um, <clears throat> I think they did a Midsummer Night. I love this idea. I think they did a Midsummer Night stream at the Globe where one of the couples were two gay men. Yes, and I'm they did a Romeo and Juliet like that. And I really, I, you know, as I say, they're there tomorrow. They yeah. c you can play, you can play them the other way tomorrow. So I'm always yeah. keen to hear about that kind of thing. I think there's one more question here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. She promised to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you've talked about how a play doesn't exist until the actors inhabit the yeah. parts. Can you say something about the difference that the audience makes to a performance? I mean, I, as I'm sure others, have been in audiences which are quick and responsive and intelligent, and in others which are like lead. How does that affect you, and what can you do about it? Well, I know my answer to that question is, it's not the audience's fault. If the audience was like lead, it's because there was something wrong with the show, but... <coughs> That's a director's response. <laughs> 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 I, think, I mean, I would say that there are different audiences and, and some audiences are more responsible than others. And, of course, that's a symbiotic relationship and so you get a better performance, obviously. If, but, um, but it's hugely... Um, I mean, I, even as an audience member, I'm, I forget... 
how, you know, because I'm always going backstage to see pals after a show and going, that's fantastic, there's such a dull audience. And I said, well, I didn't notice. So one, one has to remember on stage that, for the most part, unless you're partic- in a particularly bad audience, most audiences assume that's the audience, you know, that's, that's how they respond. But I have to say, uh, um, you notice, even in the Olivier Theatre, which is huge, at the National, you notice every single twitch, uh, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, uh, um, I can't put it into words about quite how they affect you, but you do know when you're having a buzzy night. Um, by the way, I, I don't mind about mobile phones. <laughs> I always think it's much more embarrassing for the person whose phone is going. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, oh, Don't oh, say oh. that. That's <laughs> <laughs> if there are any journos here, that's the headline. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Russell Beale says, Still "I don't mind about road mobile phones." <laughs> I do mind about ten thirty though. Ten thirty is a witching hour, probably because I'm a beer drinker. But uh, 10.30, I think audiences in this country at 10.30 go... Yeah, I agree with that. Literally. I agree. I totally agree. So, so if, you're doing, if you're killing Desdemona at quarter to 11, you're, uh, you're going to have to work hard. <laughs> I think we should probably. We should probably. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.